Hello friends, we are so glad that you are joining us. We are studying the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023 and we are in the book of Ephesians and it is a beautiful, beautiful study. The book of Ephesians is one of the epistles that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus and he expounds and focuses on the love of God and then what that love produces in the life. Now, before we get into our Sabbath School lesson, I want to introduce to you our panel. Sitting to my direct left is Pastor John Lomacain. Good to be here, James. James and John, something's going to happen here today. <laughs> <laughs> the thunder. Mine is entitled, Once Deluded by Our Own Desires. A powerful, powerful topic. Amen. And to your left is Jill Marconi. Thank you so much, Pastor James. I have Tuesday, now resurrected, ascended, and exalted with Christ. All right, amen. And to your left is Pastor John Denzi. It's a blessing to be here as well. I have Wednesday and the title is Now Blessed Forever by Grace. Amen. Mm. And finally, but not last but not least, at the very end there, Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. Praise the Lord. I have Thursday's lesson entitled Now Saved by God. So we're looking at how God rescues us. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 are going to be our main focus in our st lesson study this week. And then Ephesians 5 verse 14, Romans 5 17, Ephesians 5, 6 and 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. Before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Jill, if you wouldn't mind, would you have prayer for us? Sure. Thank Holy you. Father, we just come before you excited to be opening up your word, this wonderful study of salvation. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. And we ask right now, would you come and teach us in Jesus name? Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter two, verses four and five. Let's take a look. I'm reading from the ESV, the English uh, standard version. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together mm. in Christ. Amen. Yes. It was January of 2019 and there was a snow and ice storm in central Oregon. Trees and power poles snapped like toothpicks. Picks. And uh, the snow and ice paralyzed communities, leaving hundreds of people without power in freezing temperatures. In one or more remote location, people were huddled together trying to survive. And a local elder of a local SDA church was trapped along with his entire community, who, some of whom needed some medical care. There was nothing that they could really count on from the local county. The local county was completely swamped with calls and rescue missions. So the local church, the local Adventist church, organized all the able body body persons they could and they went to work from both sides of the snow buried community. They began by cutting down trees and limbs and shoveling through with a tractor making a narrow pathway from one end while the elder and a group of, of his community worked from the other end and they tried to come together. It took them two days. In some cases they were clambering over downed power lines which could have been dangerous if they weren't turned off but finally eventually they got to the place where they met together and the community was rescued. There's nothing like a good rescue story. And that's what we see in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter two, one through 10 gives us an up close and personal view, the, quarterly, the, the author of the quarterly says, of the grandest, most sweeping rescue mission of all time, God's redemption of the human race in Christ Jesus, the second Adam. The drama of the story is heightened by knowing that we are not mere spectators of someone else's rescue, but we are witnesses of our own rescue. I love that. What a powerful point. The lesson goes on in Sunday to describe this rescue mission in detail by quoting from Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. Now, we're not going to cover the details of all these verses in today's lesson, but I'm sure the panel is going to be looking at in more detail some of these points. What I'd like to do is just do a quick overview of a few of the verses here in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And you, he is quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. The author of the Sabbath School lesson emphasizes these three elements that work against us. The world, the devil, and our own fallen natures. Mm -hmm. And all of those are seeking to keep us into bondage, in sin and away from the glorious redemption that Christ has uh, opened for us 
through his great love. But it says here in this context that while we were by nature children of wrath, verse 4 says, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. And what I love about this is that a lot of times when we quote uh, the book of Ephesians, we, we think about salvation in relationship to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. I think those are some of our favorite verses. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we've got to memorize, for by grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, lest anyone should. So we, we have those memorized, but Paul actually, these verses are just as powerful. That's right. The first few verses of Ephesians chapter 2 are just as powerful, and in a sense, they lead up to that crescendo in verses 8 through 10. Verse 6 says, He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, verse 7 says, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward the, through, through Christ Jesus. Now, the ages to come aren't here yet, but God is going to show in the ages to come throughout all eternity, He's going to show the exceeding riches of His grace. I mean, we think God's grace is exceeding rich right now, right. but in the ages to come, we're going to see more and more of the exceeding riches of His grace, right. yeah. which is going to be amazing. You see, God, according to these verses, God is the great initiator of salvation. Mm -hmm. These verses parallel Romans chapter 5 verses 6 through 10, where it says that we, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's right. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended His love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than now being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled will be saved by his life. That's right. There is something powerful in these verses. Paul here is, uh, the author says, has already described the salvation provided to all in Christ, but all humanity had been predestined to eternal life according to Ephesians chapter uh, one in Christ. Not, not one member of the human family has been left out of God's plan of salvation. That's right. Christ died for all. And Paul briefly told the story of believers in Ephesians, the, the believers who were in the world, who were surrounded by the world and, and who were kept captive by Satan and by their own fallen natures and how God in that moment, in that time, in that experience, God came to our rescue. He initiated our salvation. In Romans chapter 5, Paul says, you know, you don't have to get yourself right in order for God to do something for you. You don't have to be good enough to come to church. Sometimes people say to me, I'm not good enough to come to church. And my response as a pastor is, you're not good enough not to come to church. God is the initiator. We're not the initiator. We can't make ourselves good enough to come to God, but we come to God as we are, and God does the work. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here. And Paul knows this. He knows this by his own experience. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, the quarterly says, Paul will tell, now tell the conversion story in more detail with a personal focus. He, he will contrast their past sinful experience, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, with the blessings of God's salvation, which he portrays in the resurrection, the ascension, and the exaltation of Jesus Christ as he celebrates the basis of that salvation in the grace and creative work of God. So Paul is all about God has accomplished this. God has accomplished in Christ Jesus all that you need for salvation. And he did this while you were yet sinners. He did this while you were yet in the world because he wanted you to see his goodness because the Bible tells us in Romans 2, 4, it's the goodness of God that does what? Leads us leads to us It to leads us to repentance. It takes us out of this world. It takes us out of the hands of the devil. It takes us out of his grip and it transforms us, heart, mind, and spirit. Mm -hmm. So these three sections of, of, uh, of Ephesians chapter 2, there's, there's three sections of Ephesians chapter 2, the quarterly goes on to say, that paraphrase this experience. Ephesians 2, 5, we were all dead in our trespasses. And then Ephesians uh, 2, 5 goes on to say, but he made us alive in Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to say, and by grace you have been saved. So you've got, we're dead, we've been made alive, and by grace we have been saved. So Ephesians Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul underlines the, the reality of this pre-conversion experience of his audience, noting that they were spiritually dead, mm -hmm. that they were practicing uh, trespasses, they were dead in their sins, that was their regular pattern of life, that's our regular pattern of life, and they were dominated by Satan. But since 
Paul is writing to these living people, he's referring to them as dead spiritually. So when he says you're dead in trespasses and sins, he's not talking about literally being dead, they're alive, but he's talking about their spiritual life is dead. They were spiritually separated from God, the source of life. Now this conversion story is kind of vital because it shows that God's amazing grace is for everyone, for all of us. You know, you'll notice that Paul himself, uh, a great multi-generational religionist, makes use of corporate language when he's talking about the experience of the Ephesians. He says, us and we, not them or you, right? Because he himself was in the same place that they were. He was dominated by the devil. He was dominated by the world and the way the world fought and he was dominated by his own fallen nature, even though he was, according to Philippians chapter three, he was uh, blameless, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, circumcised on the eighth day. He was all about being religious and righteous, but yet he was following the principles of the world. And of course, he later admits this, you know, that he was the chief of sinners. He was persecuting the church of God. And we can be very religious and yet completely and, and totally uh, consumed, controlled by the devil and by his principles. And this is what Paul is bringing out here. So how do we get deliverance from this kind of experience? Well, how did Paul get deliverance? Paul is not pretending to relate to those who are dead in trespasses and, sin and sins. Paul is a liberated sinner who was once held in bondage to righteousness by works, but he's now free in Christ to proclaim his completely lost condition is past and he is deeply religious commitment to Jesus Christ is present. And this happened to Paul by seeing the initiating love of God toward him when he was on that road to Damascus. Jesus Christ came to him directly and apprehended him and, and, and stepped into his life and uh, diverted him from the disastrous uh, task that he was about to commit and persecuting God's people or continuing to persecute God's people. So Paul is now free. He proclaims Christ uh, to the uh, Gentiles and this is what the gospel of Christ does. It, it's not a cold, lifeless, theological construct with pleasing platitudes. The gospel is a bold, heavenly assault against the very foundation of false religion. The gospel fells, divides, chips, chews up and, and, and destroys every counterfeit tree. It lays bare the forest of man's planting and directs us to the tree of life. That's and right. that's what Paul is doing here in the book of Ephesians. And he's including himself in that corporate experience of what God has done for us while we were dead in our trespasses and sins and what God is going to do us, do for us in resurrecting us and putting us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is going to be the emphasis, the theme that we see as we study this week's lesson in Ephesians chapter 2. Amen. Amen. Thank you, James. Amen. Well, once deluded by our own desires. This is a very powerful word, desires. I, uh, I think about a year ago or so, I did a sermon called A Streetcar Named Desire. <laughs> and I want to talk about something that has to do with uh, how does sin actually get born? And I want to begin in Ephesians 2, and we're going to look at verse 3 together. And I'm reading this uh, in the NIV. I read it in a couple of translations. I read it in the New King James since it was uh, started there. Uh, the Apostle Paul bringing, bringing us to the place where we are exposed to a very familiar passage, for by grace are we saved, but he reads it verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Mm -hmm. Verse four brings in the transition, but God. If you put that phrase, but God, in the Bible, you'll see in so many cases, that is the transition between failure and success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the transition between being lost and being saved. Mm -hmm. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as common to man, but God. Amen. And we find that yes, mm -hmm. without that, two word phrase, so many of us would still be lost today. Mm -hmm. So Paul starts out by talking about this human nature that we are all possessing, but he walks through it incrementally. And when we go back to the Garden of Eden, we find a very significant phrase in, in Genesis chapter three, in the, in the intercourse, the, the verbal intercourse between Eve and the serpent, when she fell and judgment was pronounced upon her, the Lord, revealed in Genesis 3 and verse 16, 
your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now let's go to Romans chapter seven. I want you to see this. I want to spend time on desire because this is something that oftentimes we don't understand. Romans chapter seven. Remember, he said, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And Jill, you know, I know you love Romans. It's one of my favorite books. <laughs> yeah. It's a book that's often misunderstood and misquoted. People try to get rid of God's law by quoting Paul, but Paul had no issue with God's law. Romans chapter seven. Now remember, your desire shall be for your husband. Okay, now let's start in verse two of Romans chapter seven. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. What are we talking about here? Now, notice Paul says that the woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. What is the law of her husband? Mm. The law of her husband, he sets the pace. Your desire shall be for your husband and he will rule over you. Mm. So as long as he's married to her, as long as she's married to him, he calls the shots. Mm. That husband has to die in order for her to be free. That's why, Genesis, that's why Romans chapter six talks about through baptism. Mm. Look at this, uh, Romans chapter six, verse six. Um, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Uh, growing up in New York, we used to call, hey, how's your old man doing? And that's the husband term. Remember that phrase? It was an old fashioned phrase. I didn't use the word old fashioned because I'm old fashioned, but it's a term <laughs> that's not used nowadays. How's your old man doing? Well, the old man is that ruling, that ruling factor that determines what we do when we yield to it. Romans 6, 16, do you not know that whomever you yield yourself as servants to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Mm -hmm. The moment you yield, the husband rules. And as long as that husband is alive, whatever the husband desires, whatever the husband desires, you are going to carry out. That's why the transition from death to life is always the desire starts. The Lord gets rid of our, our carnal desire and play, replaces it with his righteous desire. Mm -hmm. And when you go back, you find out th that the phrase desire or the word desire describes the seat of our affections. Mm -hmm. Let's go and see that in Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 14. I'm gonna try to get this as quickly as I can. Uh, you find that the fall of Lucifer mm -hmm. didn't begin with an action. It began with something that was in his heart. Verse 12, how, are you, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, that's where desire starts. Mm -hmm. It's a hard thing, but it didn't become an action until he, desired, until he desired to act on that desire, until he willed to act on that desire. It was just something he was thinking about. You said it in your heart and here are all the things he said. I will be like the most high. I will ascend into heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars. And the list goes on and on and the continued. Notice what's after desire. I will, I will, I will, I will. And when desire is connected to will, then it's followed by the action, which if the desire is good, the action is good and the outcome is good. Mm -hmm. Look at James chapter one, verse 14 and 15. The Bible says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death. Mm -hmm. Desires in the mind, but the will is the precursor to action. Notice James says, you can't say the devil made me do it. No, because <laughs> it's your desire. Now, when we, when we yield, as John 8, talks about, you are of your father, the devil, you desire to do his will. You do his will. He's been murdered from the very beginning. That's when we take that thought that's in our mind and couple it with an action. And then that action produces what we call a repetition in our lives, which becomes a habit, which produces a character, which produces a destiny. 
And so we, we've, we, we see that what, what um, the lesson is pointing out is deluded by our own desires. How do we change the seat of that desire for good fruit to be born on the other side? Mm. Let's look at a couple of other scriptures that talks about desire. Uh, 1 Samuel 20, verse 4, and I'll read it very, very carefully, very quickly. So Jonathan said to David, and this is true about all of us, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. Mm -hmm. And notice that again, whatever you desire, Jonathan said, I'll do it for you. Whatever God's desire, whatever we desire, if it's good, the Lord will do it for us. And we find carefully in the Bible that the Lord says, I will give you the desires of your heart. But do we think that God is going to give us the evil desires of our heart? The answer is absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But I want to share this quotation, and I had it here in my lesson. Listen to this, Ministry of Healing, page 176. Everything depends on the right action of the will. Mm -hmm. Desire for good and purity are right as far as they go. But if we stop here, they avail nothing. Mm -hmm. Desire is powerful, but disconnected from the will, we are helpless. Desire is where you would like to be. Will is the action that will get you there. Mm -hmm. Desire is what you would like to do. Will is the action that gets you moving. Desire is what you would like to be. Will is the action that brings out the plan of reality. But it always starts with desire. And so what the, what the writer of the lesson, Dr. John McVeigh, is bringing out, he is saying that we walked in this desire, this corruptible desire that always brought out a corruptible action. Mm. But then the Lord came along and broke that by us yielding to him. Amen. He doesn't break our will or take our will. He doesn't say, I'm going to take your will and do something else with it. We have to commit that will to him. Yep. And when we commit that will to him, then the fruit on the other side is quite different. It's his fruit. It's no longer our fruit because now, as Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. Mm -hmm. Will is the precursor to the action. And notice this, uh, Ephesians 5, verse 8 to 11. Here's what it says. But you who once, you who were once darkness, mm -hmm. but now are light in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now notice the different fruit. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Mm. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So what I want to communicate here to you in this short period of time is you've got to ask yourself, what is my desire? Mm -hmm. Where am I focused? What am I doing? Because if the desire is good, God will bring it out for a blessing. But if the desire is evil, it'll pull you in the wrong direction. Pray and ask God to give you the desires that are in harmony with his will. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Thank you, Pastor John. So we are just getting started in our lesson for this week, How God Rescues Us. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. We are studying the book of Ephesians. We are in the fourth lesson, How God Rescues Us. Ephesians is for the third quarter of 2023, and I'm handing it over to Jill Marconi. Thank you so much, Pastor James and Pastor John. What an incredible lesson. I think Ephesians 2 and Romans chapter 3 mm. are two of my favorite sections of the Word of God. As we look at that plan of salvation, Paul lays out so beautifully in both of them. I have Tuesday's lesson, Now Resurrected, Ascended, and Exalted with Christ. We're looking at Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6, and it begins with two words that Pastor John referenced when he did his section, but God. That's right. At this point of the lesson, we pivot from sin to the Savior. Mm -hmm. 
from the external forces of culture or Satan or the internal desire to Jesus, the crucified Lamb of God, mm -hmm. the resurrected Son of God, the ascended Jesus who is now seated at the right hand of the Father right. as our priest and king. Are you steeped in sin, trembling under temptation, broken under bondage, but God? That's right. Are your relationships crumbling and children questioning and health failing, yeah. but God? That's right. Are you doubting who you are in Christ? Are you enslaved with no hope for tomorrow? Are you despairing even of life, but God? Right. There's a song I love Lionel Harris sings. It's called but God. The second verse says, I know your heart is breaking. The pain just comes in waves. Everywhere you look, it seems like there is no peace. You try not to give up, but the tears will not relent. Right. Any minute now, you might accept defeat. And you stand there with impossible, the next word on your lips. Your vision has been blinded and nothing's making sense. But God sees some way when miracles are well beyond our view. His love saves the day when fear would tell us there's just no use. You can look the whole world over for the meaning of it all, for the purpose that mankind has always sought. In the end, you will discover there is no other other answer but God. Amen. Oh, I love that. There is no other answer but God. No matter where you are today, there is no other answer but God. But it doesn't stop there. So let's continue. We're in Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, mm -hmm because of his great love with which he loved us. It reminds me, Pastor James referenced this, Romans 5. Mm -hmm. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us mm -hmm. and that while we were yet, Greek says, still even now, mm -hmm. sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Let's read verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Right. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together, made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Right. This is, we see the three compound verbs here that we're gonna talk about for the rest of my lesson. Mm -hmm. Made us alive together, raised us up together, made us sit together. Mm -hmm. Dr. John McVeigh, the author of the lesson, did a great job with this lesson. We see the threefold participation with Christ, his resurrection, his ascension, and his exaltation. Amen. As believers, we are co-resurrected with Christ. We are co-ascended with Christ. We will be co-exalted with Christ, That's reigning right. with him in heavenly places. Now we can say this is gonna take place in the future and most certainly it will, will it not? We know at the second coming of Christ that those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, what's gonna happen? They're gonna be resurrected. Mm -hmm. They will ascend with Christ to heaven and they will reign as kings and priests. We will reign as kings. You will reign as kings and priests with Christ. But what about here and now? Can we actually be resurrected now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can we actually experience ascension now? Mm -hmm. Can we be co-exalted or co-seated with Christ even yes. now? Mm. Let's talk about that. Let's look at co-resurrected with Christ. This is a section that said, made us alive together with Christ. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Now we are alive together with Christ. Mm -hmm. God's resurrection power can pull you from sin. Now, in Jill's simple mind, I look at this as the justification process. Mm. The, this made alive, to me, is justification. God pulls us from sin. Pastor John, you reference Romans chapter 6. Let's look at that. Romans 6, verses 4 and 5. Mm. I love this section. Romans 6, 4 and 5. We were buried with him. This is the symbolism of baptism, of course. But we're buried with him through baptism into death. This is the old man or woman of sin. This is the desires for sin, those evil desires that Pastor John had talked about. That just as Christ was raised from the dead right. by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection 
action. Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. We looked at this in a previous lesson. But it's the same concept. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. You know, we need resurrection power in our lives. We are dead in trespasses and sin, sold under sin, enslaved in bondage, and Christ came with resurrection power to set you and I free, to say that he can break those bonds of sin and that in that moment when we accept Jesus, we can be justified. Right. We can be forgiven. We can be cleansed. We can be covered with his righteous white robe. You know, God's word had power in the very beginning, did it not? Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word created, bara in Hebrew, means to make something from nothing. And it's used when God is the subject. So in the beginning, God spoke and it was done. And where there was nothing, mm -hmm. things appeared. Do you not think God can do that in the life of the Christian? Mm -hmm. Do you not think we're that we, when we are dead in trespasses and sins and when we are, oh, we're in bondage, God can speak and you and I can be set free. In fact, David says this in Psalm 51:10, create in me a clean heart. The word create is the same word as Genesis 1:1. bara, create in me. Create in me, God, a clean heart where there was nothing, where there was sin, create instantly. Create something from nothing. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. So we looked at, made us alive together. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We're made alive together with Christ. What about ascended? This is raised us up together. We are co-ascended with Christ. I would submit to you that God's ascension power can keep you from sin. Amen. Not only does he want to deliver us from the penalty of sin, that's justification. Not only does he want to trans do that, but he wants to transform us. This is the sanctification process. God wants to help us grow in grace. As Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 18, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not just set free from sin and then we do our own thing. No, our desires need to change. Our hearts need to change. We need to become like Jesus. God's Amen. ascension power can keep you from sin. Let's look at the co-seated and the co-exaltation. Now you might think I'm going to glorification, but I'm not. Mm. When Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father, he was then given the place of power and authority. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we know this. This is known as the Great Commission. Mm. Jesus says all authority, that's excusia, power to act authority, all authority is given me in heaven and earth. And what does he say? Go, make disciples, teach, baptize, be my witnesses. Mm -hmm. God's exaltation power can, what does it do? It enables you and I to witness for him. Mm -hmm. right. First, we were dead in trespasses and sins and were made alive. Second, we ascend with him or our characters are being made like the character of Jesus. Right. Third, when we are transformed, you and I are sent forth. First Peter 2, 9, we're a chosen generation, That's a right. royal priesthood, God's own special people, that we should proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. Isaiah 43 just says it this way, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Mm -hmm. So when we look at this passage, we see, but God, we were dead in trespasses and sins, but we are made alive together. We are justified. We are raised up together. We right. are sanctified. We are exalted with Christ. We are sent forth as his witnesses. Amen. 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 Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, we now move to Wednesday's portion of the lesson. And the title is Now Blessed Forever by Grace. My name is John Dinsey, for those that are listening by radio. And we move to the first question of the lesson in Wednesday's portion. Compare God's planning for salvation in Ephesians 1, verse 3 and 4 with the eternal results of that plan described in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. 
what are essential elements and goals of God's plan of salvation. Let's go ahead and read first uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We'll go ahead and deal with this verse first. But notice that it says, Blessed be the God and Father. You know, this uh, word blessed, uh, you find it uh, in the Old Testament, you find it in the New Testament, and it's a, it's a way of saying, you know, praise be to God. Why? And then as you continue reading, you hear why the person that wrote the verse is giving blessing to God or praise to God. Now, let's go ahead and read it. He says, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Who is this us? Is it the whole world? No, this is talking about the Christians, those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, because we're talking about spiritual blessing. The whole world is blessed by God blessing us with sunshine and rain and the fruit producing earth. The whole world is blessed, but those that give their hearts to the Lord, right. those that are seeking to be like Jesus, they receive spiritual blessings that the rest of the population does not receive. The Lord continues to draw people to Him. Those that are not believers are trying, they're, they're being drawn to Christ, but until they accept, they are not receiving the rich spiritual blessings that God's children can, can receive and should receive every single day. So He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. The Lord opens doors for God's children to receive spiritual blessings mm -hmm. in heavenly places. Now notice that these are in Christ Jesus. It is because of Christ Jesus that you and I can receive blessings. You know, every day we uh, wake up, thanks to the Lord, Amen. we have a day of life. <laughs> and I remember telling this uh, one time to uh, somebody that had left the Lord for a while, and uh, seeing this person for the first time and that day, I said, the Lord has blessed us with another day. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to bed at night, you don't know if you're going to wake up. The Lord has blessed us with another day. Blessed be His name. Glory be to Him. Now, in heavenly places, it's a little phrase that is used about five times in this epistle, the book of Ephesians. And in heavenly places, and you notice that the word is italicized, places, which means that the translator said this could potentially be a good word here to help you understand this verse. But it could be places, it could be things, heavenly things, heavenly places, all through Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. Now, let's go ahead and read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Now this uh, chose us in Him before the foundation of the world is something we're going to look at. And looking in the Adventist Bible commentary, it's interesting that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, they quote the Midrash Rabbah, which says that God chose Israel before creation, the people of Israel, to be His chosen people. But in this particular verse that it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul is taking that idea of Genesis chapter 1, that God chose Israel, but then now God is choosing those that are considered Gentiles. We are chosen by God before the foundation of the world. And this is not a, in, the, in the sense of individuals, it's in, the chance, in a general sense that is being uh, presented here. Now, when was this done? Before the foundation yes. of the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine, there's a song, I think uh, Danny likes to quote it, it says, uh, while he was uh, on the cross, <laughs> I was on his mind. Mm -hmm. you no, know, that's a beautiful thought to consider that God had His eyes on us. He had His eyes on us now, but even before the foundation of the world, before you were even a thought in your parents' minds, God chose you. And that's a wonderful thing to understand. And that is a wow factor for me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, why were we chosen? Notice that it says that we should be 
holy and without blame before Him in love. Now, how do we get this idea that we could be holy and blameless before God? This is talking to us. It's a little hint of the plan of salvation. That the only way that you and I could be holy and blameless before God is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that you and I can be holy and blameless before God, before the whole universe. And, you know, I, I, I sometimes stop and think about this because I remember a time that uh, when I was younger filling out this um, employment form and then I got to a section there have you ever been in prison? Have you ever committed a crime? <laughs> and well, praise the Lord, I had not been in prison or committed a crime. And I said, well, why is that there? And apparently some things follow you in this world. Somebody is going to remember that you did something. You may mm -hmm. be living your life fine. You haven't seen somebody for a long time. You meet somebody that remembers that you did something way back that you have forgotten. Hey, aren't you that guy that did such and such? <laughs> so these labels follow you. But because of Jesus, you and I, those that accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior, that past is gone, buried, forgotten, yeah. and it's no more. Uh, nothing is going to be brought back to you. Aren't you the guy that used to steal? You know, aren't you the guy that used to do that? Aren't you that person that used to lie? No, all of that is gone. Blameless before God and before the universe by the grace of God. Blessed be His holy name, I say to that. I'd like to read to you something here from Fundamentals of Education, page 403. Fundamentals of Education, 403, by Ellen G. White. It says, Before the foundations of the earth were laid, the covenant was made that all who were obedient, all who should through the abundant grace provided, become holy in character and without blame before God by appropriating that grace that by appropriating that grace should be children of God. This covenant made from eternity was given to Abraham hundreds of years before Christ came. Mm. With what interest and what intensity did Christ in humanity study the human race to see if they would avail themselves of the provision provided? Provision has been provided through Jesus Christ so that you could be blameless. Take the opportunity and become a child of God if you have not done so. And remember, we're dealing with the question, compare God's planning for salvation in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, with the eternal results of that plan described in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. We're ready for Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, limited time. It says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. These are words that are rich uh, with spiritual uh, blessings to, for us to dig into. And I encourage you to do that. Make that your study today. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, wonderful verse. And uh, again, uh, I'm reading to you now from... The Faith I Live By, a wonderful thought really taken from the book Steps to Christ. It says, in the matchless gift of His Son, God has encircled the whole world with an atmos atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the, grove, the globe. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ. Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Dr. John Mevey, uh, he has a wonderful quote here. Uh, he did a wonderful job in this lesson, and I'd like to read from the lesson to you. Notice what it says. God's plan, rooted in divine counsels in time immemorial, Ephesians 1, 4, stretches forever into the future. It includes all the coming ages, Ephesians 2, 7. His plan for the eternal future is founded on the same principle as his actions in the past, present and present, the principle of grace. In the coming ages, God looks forward to demonstrating the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, 7, Paul thinks of God's grace as a treasure of, or fortune of unfathomable value and from which believers may draw to meet any need. This grand generosity of God toward us becomes an eloquent 
ageless and cosmic exhibit of His grace. Praise be to God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you guys so much being able to, as always, when you're in Thursday's position, you get to hear all of the greatness uh, that helps me be able to produce my lesson a little bit better because I don't have to cover all of the things that they've covered. I get to produce some new stuff. So praise the Lord for that. This message is powerful. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, I agree with you, Jill. It's one of my favorite passages. And uh, I'm Ryan Day and I have Thursday's lesson entitled, Now Saved by God. And right here in Thursday's lesson, we're simply reminded based on everything that we've studied so far in verses 1 through 7, we see that the emphasis obviously has been that, you know, we're sinners. You know, we're, we're locked in our desires, we're locked in our trespasses and trapped by the sin of this world, but God, mm -hmm. right? But God comes along, Jesus comes along and he transforms us, he, he saves us by his grace. And then of course, uh, Paul confirms and he wants you to understand absolutely clearly without any hesitation, without any confusion, where that salvation comes from. Mm -hmm. In other words, yes, as Pastor brought up very clearly, we have to surrender our will to Him. And so that is ultimately what we do, if anything at all. We surrender our will to Him, but the salvation, the saving comes 100% from God. And so now we come to those two famous verses that many of us are familiar with at the end of this particular section, verses 8 and 10, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 10. But I'm going to back up. I want to just, re just read it within context so that it matters because oftentimes we, we isolate these two texts, but could just bring it back a little bit and read it from verse four onward and we'll pick up in verse eight as we go along. Go back back in verse four of Ephesians two, it says, but God who in who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then there's the parenthetical statement here, by grace you have been saved and raises us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I mean, my goodness, it's borderline poetry. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, we don't want to just lower it to just poetry. This is, this is uh, obviously the inspired words of God. And right here, we're gravitating towards verses 8 and 10, which says, for by grace mm. you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Mm. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And, and you guys know me, I'm a, I'm a musically minded person. I, I, I did not plan, in fact, I don't have it in my notes at all, but as I'm reading through this text, I can't help but think of that powerful song written by Bill Gaither, uh, Sinner Saved by Grace. Mm -hmm. The second verse of that song, every time I read Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and 10, all I can hear is those words. How could I boast? In anything I've ever seen or done, how could I dare to claim as mine the victories God has won? Where would I be had God not brought me gently to this place? I'm here to say I'm nothing but a sinner saved by grace. I just, those powerful words just ring out in, in, in harmony with this message here because God is reminding because he's saying, look, yes, you have to surrender your will to me but understand where this saving power is coming from. And my friends, we are, we are in a world today, especially in, within the church, there's so many people that are led to believe a lie and believing that they have something to add or they have something to do that somehow contributes to their salvation. And, and it took me a while. I used to be one of these people. In fact, I was taught early on in my early experience in Seventh-day Adventism, someone taught me that, it, you know, it's 50% you and it's 50% God. Mm. And when you get that into your mind, you think, oh, of course, God's going to own up to his 50 percent. He's going to come through with his 50 percent. But man, when you start to have that mentality that your salvation is 50 percent your work, you can never, ever get past the 1 percent. 
mm. because you can't work hard enough or accomplish enough to gain or to win or to accomplish your own salvation. And I love what the lesson says here at the bottom here uh, of this segment here. It says, in conclusion, speaking of Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10, it says, uh, Paul goes back over this ground wishing to ensure that his point sticks. So he's wanting to stick it home. He says, the salvation of believers is a divine work, not a human one. It does not originate in us, but is God's gift. No human being can boast of having uh, sparked it. Uh, it says, standing in the grace of God, we believers are, uh, are exhibits of His grace and only His grace. I love that. We are His masterpieces created by God in Christ Jesus. And it, of course, as I'm studying through this lesson, it reminds me of a, a, a funny story that's kind of like a joke, but this uh, just elder goes to sleep one night he has a dream. So it's all based on a dream. He's, he's dreaming and in this dream he shows up at the gates and he sees St. Peter and says, hey, you know, I'm here. I'm, 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 I'm going to go into heaven. And Peter says, no problem. Is it just, just, you got to have a hundred points. He says, what do you mean a hundred points? He says, well, you got to have a hundred points for me to let you into heaven. He says, well, how do I get a hundred points? He says, well, tell us some good things, you, you know, tell us about your life. Tell us, tell us, how, you know, about yourself. He said, well, uh, I went to the same church all my life. I was very devoted, never missed a, a church service. He said, all right, that's good. That's worth a couple of points. He said, a couple of points? Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a second. That, that's that's got to be worth a little bit more than that. He goes, well, what else you got? Uh, well, he says, I, oh, I was married to the same woman for 57 years. He goes, oh, that's wonderful. That's worth about five points. Five points? Uh, my goodness. He goes, that's got to be worth a whole lot more. He goes, well, what else you guys? Oh, oh I got it. He says, I, every week I was, I was very consistent in serving in our local soup kitchen. I'd done all these good deeds. I helped the poor and I helped people and done all these wonderful deeds. Surely that accounts for something. He goes, well, yeah, that'll give you, I don't know, maybe a couple of more points. And finally, the guy just in, just in total de you know, desperateness, he screams out, oh, no. He goes, oh, it's only going to be by the grace of God that I get into heaven. And Peter says, ah, finally, that's worth 100 points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's a silly little story, but still it, the idea is that many people have this concept that what they do is somehow going to contribute to their salvation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take 100 points. It takes 100% of God's grace in order to, for us to have salvation. Yeah. And this is ultimately what Paul is talking about, even Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, the point that he's driving home here. He says, uh, do not set aside the grace of God. Don't set that aside. Don't just set it aside as something small. Some people do that. They say, well, you know, Yes, God is love and God saves us by his grace, but you know, we've got to have the law. And yes, the law has its important uh, aspect and its important place within the plan of salvation. And works do play an important role in the overall experience of salvation. But Paul says here, don't set the grace of God aside. Galatians 2 verses 20 and 21. He says, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And there's many people. And we know this. We, we, we've, we, we've, we've run into this experience and it's a, it's a curse. It's a, it's a lie that people think that somehow if you keep all the commandments perfectly, that it's that somehow that's going to get you some, you know, gold stars by your name in heaven. Or Jesus is up there with his record book and he's going, mm, they kept the law really good today. I think I'll just go ahead and let them in. Mm. No, that's not how it works. Um, we keep the law because we have been saved by grace through faith. That's what Romans chapter one, verse five says, is that we, we have been given grace for obedience. Mm. And so that's the result of the grace of God and which he has given us. And of course, you know, Paul drives this home even strong. I don't have time to read all the passage here, but if you really want to understand this do uh, versus the grace of God, you know, how we do and what we do would not do that contributes to salvation or not or doesn't contribute to salvation. Paul drives it home in Philippians chapter three. Uh, you can read verses one through eight to get the clear context here. But, you know, Paul lists his his spiritual resume. He, he talks about how, you know, he was circumcised the eighth day. This is, a, uh, this is Philippians chapter uh, three, verses five and onward. He says, you know, of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. He says, look, I kept the law better than anyone. Mm -hmm. There's none of you. And that's why I love Paul. That's why I can relate to Paul because Paul, this brother has been, he's been in both opposites, right? I mean, he's mm -hmm. been in, it seems like in both extremes, or at least he's, he's been at least one to one extreme. And that was, he at one time thought, you know what, it's about what you do. Mm -hmm. But he quickly learned in this grace experience that he had with Jesus Christ that it's not about what you do, it's who you know. Mm -hmm. And who you know changes what you do. And so that's why here in verse 7 of Philippians 3 and onward, he says, But what things were gained to me? 
These I have counted lost for Christ. He says, my spiritual resume, all the things I've done, he says, great, but you know what? I've counted them lost for Christ. Mm -hmm. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He says, but you take all of that, put it all in one big giant box, everything I've ever done good. He goes, here it is. I count them as, and of course, King James Version or New King James Version says rubbish, not that works don't matter uh, because it's a result of what we do. But at the end of the day, your salvation comes, your saving comes by God and God alone. Not anything that you have done, 100% of the grace of God and the work of Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. And this is really the emphasis that Paul has in Ephesians chapter 2. We've got time for a few closing comments. We'll start with Pastor Loma King. Very short quotation from a gentleman by the name of John Joe Rossini. He wrote a book called Desires of Powerful Emotion. He says, one of the most powerful human emotions is desire. Since every waking moment of our lives, we are spent with either trying to gain pleasure or trying to avoid pain. And then he ends by saying, if you get hungry, if you are hungry, you get food. If you are feeling lonely, you have a desire for another person. And he says, just about every moment is spent or invested trying to fulfill some desire. I pray that those moments will be spent trying to fulfill the desires of the Lord. Amen. I think the two important words for my section is, but God. Mm -hmm. Are you lost in sin? Are you stuck in addiction? Are you on the legalistic side? But God, look to Jesus. Amen. 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 I want to leave you with the thought that before the foundation of the world, God chose you to be blameless before God because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A great capstone text, I think, that really sums us up. Galatians 2, verse 20, which Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, by faith in the Son of God, who loved and gave himself for me. Amen. You know, these verses in Ephesians chapter 2 are teaching us that this great controversy swirling all around us and in us day by day. Uh, reminds us of our need for Jesus Christ and His grace. So never despair, never give up. We are loved, we are precious, we are redeemed, we are ransomed, we are bought back from sin by the love of Christ. Next week's lesson, number five, Horizontal Atonement, the Cross and the Church.